Okay. Our Thank next uh, speaker is Karin Asian from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And she's going to present uh, her project uh, on upwelling in the Western Beaufort. Karin, are you online? I'm here. All right, all yours. Okay. So can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for ha inviting me to come talk about uh, my project. Um, I'm just back two weeks from Alaska, so this is definitely um, just a snippet of what we did in, in some of the preliminary results. Um, our cruise was from August 25th to September 18th of this year on the research vessel Sekuliak, and I had a nice, a great team of um, co-PIs as well as a bunch of wonderful technicians and, and uh, graduate students and postdocs, et cetera, to help me. So our, we are motivated for this project by um, uh, the observation that beluga whales are often found out at the shelf break while bowhead whales are found on the shelf itself. And this figure is an oldie but goodie. It came from Sue Moore. It was part of her PhD work. Um, and you can see in the graph that the yellow dots are the belugas and they really are found along the shelf break in highest concentrations and further in the basin and not very many of them are found on the shallow Beaufort shelf itself. So, um, we thought that their reason they were found there is because they can find high numbers of their Arctic cod prey uh, along the shelf break. And what we believed was going on is that when you have upwelling winds from the east, um, then followed by, uh, by relaxation or low winds, that the, um, zo the zooplankton prey of Arctic cod would be, would be upwelled and concentrated, and that the Arctic cod, which are the prey for the belugas, would then be attracted to the shelf break to feed on that high aggregation of, of uh, zooplankton. So the cod are then uh, present in high numbers and the belugas can easily find them. So we went out to, to explore whether this is what was going on, um, if this is why the belugas are found at the shelf break, if their prey is found in high concentrations and what were the physical and biological mechanisms that might cause those concentrations to be there. And so the specific objectives of our, our trip was to describe the distributions and nutri nutritional value of both zooplankton and of forage fish. This would be Arctic cod that are fed on by the beluga whales and the association of, of those two factors with hydrography and with upwelling. And we also wanted to look at upwards and shelfward displacement of water and plankton onto the shelf during upwelling and to decide, uh, determine if upwelling of forage fish prey along the shelf break um, could influence the formation of um, forage fish prey, um, influence the, for the formation of forage fish aggregations. And we were going to identify the associations between upwelling events, um, forage fish abundance, and then the occurrence of upper trophic, large upper, upper trophic level predators that um, rely on these preys. And the upper trophic level predators could include, in addition to belugas, which were the primary target of our of our the food chain that we were looking at, but of our work, but was also bowhead whales or um, um, marine birds could also be seen along um, the shelf break, we thought. And um, we also wanted to know in the longer term than just our cruise, um, how frequent are these upwelling events? How persistent is this phenomenon? Um, how persistent is the formation of these prey aggregations? And um, we wanted to try to understand or predict the future occurrences of upwelling and the associated response. And this would be done um, both during looking at data collected from uh, longer term moorings and also using modeling. And um, I was at, asked to see if it, this was relevant to the marine ecosystem group performance elements. And I went and looked and it seems like there's aspects of all three of them that are represented in this project. So um, our project left from Nome, Alaska. The top graph shows the uh, cruise, the entire cruise track, and you can see the smudge up on the Beaufort shelf. That's where our primary operating area was. Over the period of the cruise, we did we covered 2,900 nautical miles, and we did repeated sampling um, across transects oriented across the shelf break. So in the lower panel, you can see. Oh, can you see my my mouse moving? Yes. Okay, good. So in the lower transect, you can see this was our primary operating area right here at the shelf break. This is north of uh, Nuiqsut, is Alaska is located down here. Um, uh, Prudhoe Bay is quite a bit further over to the east and, and Barrow is about 120 miles to the west. 
And so we had seven transect lines that were set up along the shelf, um, along the shelf break going from inshore to offshore. And we basically sampled stations along these lines. Some of them we sampled um, five or six times during the course of the cruise. We just keep, kept repeatedly sampling them. And we did 184 stations. Um, there was a CTD at each one of them. And you can see we did a large number of, of bongo toes. Um, of tucker trawls, which were a, a net, a different kind of net we used to catch larger um, and faster organisms such as small fish and, and krill, and um, some ring nets. We also did um, 16 midwater fish trawls um, for mooring deployments, and we fortuitously uh, um, retrieved a slocum glider. Oops. Well, that's interesting. Anyway, okay. So we had 18 scientists on board and two marine technicians and 20 crew for a total complement of 40. And I just want to point out that we had along two postdoctoral scholars, two graduate students, and we also had a middle school teacher from Long Island as part of the Polar Trek program, a journalism student, or she was actually recently received her degree um, from UAF, and she did a lot of the social media out, outreach and one community observer. So one of the big questions about our project was whether we would encounter upwelling, and I'm happy to say that we encountered two very nice upwelling events during the cruise. The, this uh, graph shows the um, various wind statistics. The data is along the horizontal axis, and the um, wind speed is and, and direction is plotted as vectors in the top graph. The next two are the, um, the, the direction and the wind speed separately. And what I did is I've shaded the times when you had upwelling versus the times when we didn't, which was the times are shown in white. And upwelling occurs when we have winds from the east of five to six meter per, per second or greater. And so um, you can see that we arrived at the location around the 29th of August and we started right up with an upwelling event. We then had a period of relaxation and then we had another very strong upwelling event later on in the cruise. So we were lucky to have two upwelling events. We saw some complex hydrography for across the shelf break. This shows uh, temperature and on the left and salinity on the right sections from one of our transects. And I'm going to just point out that the looking at the temperature, vertical distributions, you see a whole bunch of different water masses were present, starting with the um, Atlantic water um, at the bottom, polar halocline Atlantic water. We then had a layer of winter water. Um, Chukchi summer water was at about 50 meters and um, th then a layer of meltwater and then at the top we saw Mackenzie River water which was very warm and fresh. And so what would happen during these upwelling events is this stuff would all get kind of mixed together. So we have some really interesting data to try to interpret. Now upwelling of course is when you have upwards movements of water um, uh, along the shelf break and so I'm using in this graph we're looking at salinity from along two of the lines. The one on, on the left shows the section um, during upwelling and the one on the right shows the section when upwelling is not occurring. And um, if you, I've, what I've shown with the arrows is the, look, the depths at which the 34 um, salin, uh, salinity iso um, haline intersects the bottom of the, of the shelf. And you can see during upwelling it was at about 120 meters and during periods of relaxation it was at about 150 meters. Um, so, as I said before, we did repeat sampling across the seven transects. I'm just showing you this graph again because to, to, the next graph is going to look at the temporal, evo, uh, temporal evolution of some of the locations of the of, of different um, temperature and salinity, uh, the temperature and salinity of the bottom water. So I'm going to take you out of geographic space, but this is where these, these data came from. And so in these graphs, what we have is on the horizontal axis, we've got the date and on the vertical axis, we've got the log of the bottom depth. And so if you look, the top of the, each graph is um, on the shelf and the uh, bottom part of each graph is um, offshore, 400 meters depth. Again, I've shown periods of upwelling with the, the, the shaded areas. This time I've enclosed them with a red box. And so on the left, let's just take a look at salinity first. And we see that during periods of upwelling, you see that the isohalines tend to move um, shallower. So the 34 uh, parts, well, the 34 PSU uh, isohaline was down at about 180 meters and moved upwards um, uh, 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 towards um, um, 125 meters or so. And this is data from each one of those lines. And so it's plotted against time rather than against a geographic location. What's really kind of interesting is when you look at bottom temperature on the right, you see these lobes of cold water just moving onto the shelf during the upwelling. And during the relaxation period in the middle, you see that it moves back down off the shelf 
um, to the north and you start to see warmer water spreading across the shelf again. So what we did is we used the, the depth where the 34 PSU isohaline intersects the shelf, the bottom, the seafloor as a, sort of an index um, to indicate whether or not upwelling is going ongoing and that's the red line that's in this graph. Um, and again, the periods of upwelling are shaded. So here in the upwelling, it's, it's about 100, at the start of upwelling, it's about at 140 meters. And then you see it start coming up and it goes up to about 115 during the first event. And then we have relaxation. And then the second much stronger event actually occurred and you see a, a nice upwards movement of the, where you're seeing that, that isohaline intersect the shelf break. So what I did, uh, what I did next was to interpret some of the biological distributions by using this index. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I should explain it, say it. We also had a nitrate sensor on our CTD, and so this shows some very early data from the nitrate sensor. This was collected by Kate Lowry, who was a post, one of the postdoctoral scholars on our cruise. And on the left, you see um, before upwelling, and on the right, you see during upwelling. And you can see that these are the same, the same two transects, but at different times, so the same geographic locations. You can see that the, um, that the nitrate, again, has upwelled up higher in the water column and might be available for the phytoplankton during, um, during those upwelling events. So um, we sampled um, zooplankton, in the, which are the Arctic cod prey, using two different types of nets, the bongo nets and then the tucker trawl on the right. And we haven't been able, of course, to count any of these samples. In fact, we don't even have them back yet. They still haven't arrived from Newport, or Newport Port, Oregon. But what we did was on shore is we wrote, took notes about what we saw um, in all the samples. And so we made a rough kind of categorization about whether they were samples that seemed to be from off the shelf or, or more characteristic of, of the slope and the basin or on the shelf. And these pictures are showing you some, a great catch of curl that we got. Um, this would be an off the shelf kind of, um, of a zooplankton community. So this graph is a little bit complicated. Um, the, again, it's, it's sort of similar to the ones where I showed you um, the evolution through time. So on the horizontal axis, we have time um, throughout the cruise. The shading again indicates the periods when upwelling is ongoing. And plotted as the dark black line is the depth of the 34 PSU isohaline where it intersects the shelf. Um, the vertical axis for that is shown on the right. And I reversed it so that um, when, from the previous graph so that when upwelling is ongoing, we see it pointed downwards. It's the, it's the shallower. So it's like nine, uh, 95 um, meters depth at about day 252 seen here. And then the dots are showing um, whether our rough categorization about whether we saw offshore in blue or onshore um, types of zooplankton um, in green. And it does seem that during the periods of upwelling, which is when this, the V line goes down, gets shallower, the isohaline gets shallower, you see the movement of off shelf organisms onto the shelf. And during periods of relaxation, they move back off the shelf. Oh, and the, the vertical axis for the zooplankton is the distance from where that isohaline intersected the shelf. That's on the vertical axis. So they're moving, they move back off shelf during periods of relaxation. We also um, caught a lot of uh, young small cod um, from the, thick, the tucker trawl. And these we actually counted because we picked them out of the, of the sieves when we were processing the samples to put them away. And so these are actually abundances. And I've plotted the different colors as, as day or night to see if we had a systematic difference. And there, there actually might be larger catches during the night, but it's probably not significantly different. What does seem interesting is that after um, periods of upwelling, we may have had larger abundances of the younger small cod caught in those nets as well. Um, also during the cruise, we used a, really, a large midwater trawl, or I guess it's not large, but it was large to me because I'd never seen anything quite so big on, on a, a research vessel to catch larger fish. Um, and from these samples, we're gonna be looking at um, fish stomach contents to see what they've been eating and to see if there's a difference in what their prey is during periods of upwelling, but during periods when upwelling is not ongoing. And we'll also be looking at their ages um, from the otoliths there, which have the daily growth rings. So those samples are all waiting to be analyzed. And here's the picture of the trawl. The Sikuliak was a fantastic platform um, and we had lots of room on the, the deck for all of our equipment, including this, this pretty large net. 
the Sekuliak is also equipped with an EK-60, um, which is a, we call it, well, a fish finder in essence, which has five frequencies of bioacoustic data. Um, the, this shows one, a, a screen grab from a, one, of the, one of the times when we were running it, well, we ran the instrument all the time, but what it shows you is going from left to right is the different frequencies. The low frequencies are on the left, that's 18, 38, 70, 120, and 200. So the ones on the left are going to be showing us the, where the, the, the larger organisms, such as fish, and the ones on the right are going to be showing us the, um, how many of the smaller organisms, such as zooplankton, so the, so the krill and the, uh, and the copepods. And this is probably krill right in here. Um, the advantage of using multi-frequency is also that you can look at the differences in, in acoustic intensity between the frequencies for, for each location and also look at the frequency response curve for each of the like for each location and you can get it at you can you can try to you can quantify in a sense what you're looking at by looking at, at the differences between the frequencies so we'll be analyzing all of those data to see um, again the impact of upwelling but we did see that along um, the shelf break, we saw a persistent um, dense patch of fish at about 250 meters um, at most of the crossings of the shelf break. So this is, a, again, screen grabs um, from one of the low frequencies, just showing here's the shelf, the seafloor, and this is a dense aggregation of what is probably um, Arctic cod along the shelf break. We also did an interesting experiment where we stopped over one of those patches and just hung out there for um, a quite overnight to see if we could see a dial signal in the shape of the patch. And that's what's shown in this figure. On um, the time axis on this figure is actually local time. So the 1900, it starts at around 1900 when it was still daylight. Um, the sun set at around 2100 and then it rose again at about seven o'clock in the morning. And you can see that the, the, the intense patch kind of became much less intense and rose up in the water column. And so we're now working on figuring out um, how this, what's going on and what, to what depth they're going to see if they're get, going to get prey. Other projects we had on board where we had uh, marine mammal and bird observations. This was done from the bridge. And we also had Kate Lowry who was doing phytoplankton abundance type um, distribution and response to upwelling in addition to the work that she was doing with the nitrates, uh, looking at the nitrate ac across the shelf break. So she'll be putting all of that together. She doesn't have any more results except that one section right yet, but everyone's got data and we're beginning to work on it. Um, we deployed four year-long moorings. Um, they're located here and here. Um, this shows one of the moorings going in. This, is, um, this one was equipped with um, an, uh, an ADCP and a uh, CTD up here in the float area. And then this is an oral, which is a, a recorder for, that will record marine mammal vocalizations. And then there's the releases and it's, and it's being deployed. So we had the four moorings, three of them were equipped with an ADCP. All of them had a CTD. Um, three had the oral acoustic recorder and one of them had an acoustic zooplankton fish profiler. And they'll be out for a year and we hope that next year we'll get them back and we'll have some really interesting information on the when um, we see beluga whales in this area um, and different other different marine mammals and also what the zooplankton and the fish are looking at are looking like during that time. We had several outreach projects on board. We um, are the Diana Campbell from the graduate student from UAF um, did ran a Facebook page. She also did Instagram and Twitter. We also had Lisa Seff who was a polar trek teacher who of course was doing her polar trek journals. Um, I sent daily email updates to a list of 92 people representing local communities and subsistence organizations, as well as colleagues who are also working in the region. So, for example, the scientists um, who were on the NP, the um, the, no, the scientists who were on the, sh the cruise that was uh, part of the um, NPRB Arctic IERP, they were out at the same time. So, we were sending each other our daily updates. Um, the day we came in um, to Nome at the end of the cruise, we had a visit by 90 students from the Anvil City Science Academy, um, and we had a bunch of stations set, set up on the ship, and we all took, stood at the stations and showed them various things on the, on the crew, during the crew, that we would do during the cruise. On the left, Steve Okenen is talking about the CTD, and on the right, Celia Gelfman is showing a budding young biologist some plankton. And then I also gave a public lecture in um, Nome Straight Science, their lecture series um, after we got back. And finally, just going back again to the glider, we, um, as this was in the, uh, the, the Fairbanks Daily News Miner, 
um, not so long ago, the other day actually, um, as we were going north in the uh, Chukchi Sea, our path intersected where there was a glider that had lost its ability to, to communicate. And so we were able to retrieve that um, and, and, and bring it back. Um, and this was a, this is, it was great that we were able to pick that up and help out and, um, and, and not lose this valuable asset because it could have, if we hadn't picked it up, it would have been, no doubt it would have been lost, either washed up on the shore somewhere or gone off to the west. And you can see that the scientist, Kate Stafford, was very happy to get it back. And so the, um, you know, the, the, the cruise was, um, had a lot of people help us out. And I just want to um, point out that there were a bunch of people helping us. And, and I also want to thank the National Science Foundation for supporting our work. And that's all I have. And I'd be happy to take any questions and on questions. Thank you, Karin. Um, questions for Karin, please. Hey, Karen, this is Greg. I was just thinking about crashing to the ice there back in the 90s, but um, I had a question you may not, I'm not sure if you know, are belugas pretty vocal and if so, more or less than bowheads? Okay, so interestingly, you know, we did not see any belugas, <laughs> which is really kind of shocking. Um, and the aerial surveys didn't see them either. But yes, belugas can vocalize. And in fact, Kate Stafford has a paper written about um, using this, these same types of acoustic these same types of recorders um, to look at beluga occurrences um, in the area near Barrow in Barrow Canyon. And I think that paper might be out in the, um, uh, in, in the second SOAR special issue. I think it's certainly you can get it online now, even if it's not out in print yet. Uh, Karen, this is Jackie. <laughs> Did you see uh, showing the upwelling events and the changes in the biology and the physics when we had that weather while we were on the Healy, you know, you were out in the Sukuliak, were you able to do before and after any measurements? Yeah, well, so, so the first, yes, we did. Um, if, and I, I could, well, I guess I can zoom back here. Um, this, so this is the, the, I think the, this is when we first got there. And then I think the really big blow when we were up, we were talking about how you, you know, you have to stop working, whatever, that was this second upwelling event. And we were able to do CTDs throughout the entire event, um, but we could not do net toes after a certain period of time. And if you look at this graph, you can see these funny little zigzags on this particular transect. That's us tacking during this, during that upwelling event. Because after a point, we just couldn't go on the straight on straight on the line. But the ship rides great, and we were able to do CTDs throughout that event. Right. Thanks. And we did that example on Jackie's DBO line over here too, or, or everybody's DBO. Line, but this is DBO six. Yeah, oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> like I present that at the workshop. <laughs> I'll, I'll lead into the next uh, leading into the next talk. Yeah, that's a perfect uh, segue. Any other questions for Karin? If not, uh, let's go with um, the DBO update from Jackie. Thank you, Karin. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. So, can you see that? No. How about now? Yeah, now. Okay. Perfect. All right. And you can hear me, so I will begin to, so we can end on time. So the update I'd like to provide uh, for you is on the, uh, on the DBO efforts that we did this year, a little bit on the previous ones and some future planned activities. Um, first of all, that uh, I think you've all seen this. <laughs> I just see myself talking, but that's okay. Um, you can see that uh, this is the standard uh, map that we have. We've expanded the DBO one through five, as you know, starting in 215, to have lines working with our Canadian colleagues uh, in six, seven, and eight. And as Karen said, that they've occupied uh, in the talk that she just gave on the DBO six. We have Canadians uh, occupying DBO eight and four. Uh, I haven't seen those data sets. Uh, coming in yet, but they will be at our, our workshop that we'll have. But as you all know, we have these uh, uh, transect lines and bounding boxes in hotspot areas on a latitudinal gradient from the northern bearing, as you can see, up into the Chukchi, and then from uh, west to east in the, in the Beaufort Sea. 
And these are areas that were focused on the high biodiversity productivity and changes that we were seeing up into the beginning of this program. And so it's being used as a change direct detection array. And an important point I'd like to bring out is that uh, the um, work that we're doing is not only national and, in and international. And so we have multi-agency support as well as you can see the uh, main six countries that are working in the Pacific Arctic region. So this is just a brief timeline. Um, I, I'm not gonna go through all of this, just point out a few things because I, this will be posted, this PowerPoint is on the uh, IARPIC uh, uh, Marine Ecosystem website. But we started off with the bio sea ice workshop. We had a beginning phase in the DBO program. We had a DBO committee uh, collaborative team that is now incorporated into the marine ecosystem team. Um, we got some, uh, began NSF funding and then all the other interagency funding started in 2012. Completed our milestones that we had designated for the first IARPIC science plan. And then are moving into uh, the implementation phase with the eight DBO regions. And part of that is including a, a marine regional assessment that we're calling the PARMA. And we have, Sue Moore and I have a paper coming out in press that describes this timeline, how the DBO formed and where, uh, what's happening now and where it's going. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, obviously we're on the line with uh, Guillermo, uh, Danielle Dixon from NPRB and myself are, are co-chairing this. And then we have the um, onwards, we have support for the Arctic Observing Network from NSF as well as the NOAA Arctic Research Program and field support through other agency, BOEM, NASA, NPRB, Fish and Wildlife, and USGS on ongoing studies they have in which they're including sampling such as uh, Karen was mentioned on the Seculia program she has. So the, uh, these are the core measurements again. We have this uh, on previous presentations, but they, the standard ones are the beginnings that we ask everybody to measure as much as they can on one or more of these lines. Uh, starting what with temperature, salinity, and currents, and you can read this as well as I can, chlorophyll, nutrients. And then we're looking at, it's because it's a biological observatory, we're looking at the composition, biomass, and, and uh, size of various types of organisms from plankton up to the benthos. And then we include standard marine surveys of marine mammals and, and, and seabirds. And the second part of that is the second tier is the fisheries acoustics and, and bottom trawling that is not done every year. And then I just would point out there's underway uh, measurements. And so there was agreement on the uh, various cruises to try to uh, access as much as this or sample as we can, excuse me. Uh, I always turn my cell phone off when I, uh, it's my daughter from South Africa, but I'm hanging up on it. Um, <laughs> I can call her back. So uh, just to, I wanted to point out here um, that we also have multiple other types of measurements that are done when people either have DBO cruises or embed them. And I have a listing that they've run from ocean acidification, uh, growth rates, looking at production studies, trawling, camera, um, and then also genetics moorings uh, using infrastructure such as sail drone and gliders. And in this year, I would just point out that because of the uh, die-offs that were happening with the uh, seabird surveys, or seabirds particularly, and also marine mammals, uh, people are interested in the harmful, uh, harmful algal blooms. So uh, just as an example of our standard five um, uh, cruises that we have, and then have uh, the, um, uh, different, the red dots are basically where we actually include more CTDs to get a, a transect line. And these are the DBO1 from the Northern Bering Sea up into the DBO5 off of the uh, barrel area. Um, on an annual basis, we put together uh, the DBO and Pacific Arctic group, uh, as many cruises as we can uh, identify that are where they're going, dates, ships, uh, DBO regions, what the projects are. The Asgard project funded by the uh, North Pacific Research Board was the first one out. They occupied DBO regions uh, two and three and ran those lines. And then who the contacts are. So this is actually posted on the, uh, the DBO, the NOAA website that we have. And I think I've linked it onto the IR, IARPIC site also. So just to bring up, just to put this in perspective, uh, these are the five DBO lines on a time series. So on the uh, horizontal, you're seeing from when satellite records began in the late 70s up to 2016. 
and the seasonal sea ice persistence. So Karen Fry, Fry working with the NASA has been looking at the uh, earlier sea ice retreat in the spring, noticing later sea ice return. And we've seen this and all of this influences the phenology or the timing of when production happens. And so you're moving from the south here and DBO1 up into Barrow Canyon area, DBO5. The most dramatic being up in the northern uh, Chukchi Sea and over into the Beaufort into the basin, as we've seen probably in, uh, in, in other presentations. At the same time, she's put together some uh, looking at the uh, fact that we have earlier spring brooms. And you can see this, I put these little red arrows here. In the different regions, um, usually what happens, DBO1, once the ice pulls back, then we are, we're out of the bloom, the major bloom areas at this, in the spring period. But you'll notice that, in fact, we're starting to get peaks in certain areas, such as the uh, south of Bering Strait and also north of Bering Strait. These, there's an increase in the fall bloom. I don't know why these are advancing, but here, uh, you should still hear me, right, Guillermo? Guillermo? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because oh, for some reason, it's advancing. So um, anyway, so I just wanted to point these out. So this is marching from the south up to the north. You can see we have uh, dual blooms now in the Chirikov Basin and the southern uh, Chukchi Sea. And um, actually, uh, uh, Victoria Hill has a nice synthesis paper out, uh, also pointing to this uh, in, a new, in the second issue of the uh, SOAR volume that's coming out uh, this uh, soon. And then moving up to the northern Bering Sea, and the SOAR is the synthesis of Arctic research, and Sumor and Phyllis Stabino are the co-leads on that. So if we go to the next one, just an example, I think some of you have seen this before. We have collections of chlorophyll for standing stock. We look at the species composition and collaboration, both with our Canadian colleagues and looking at the taxonomy. This is the hot spot here, actually up in the offshore part of the northern um, uh, Chukchi Sea. Diatoms are offshore and more of the uh, dinoflagellates and smaller plankton are, are in the nearshore coastal waters. And then here you're seeing uh, in July, this is the rich nutrient water that uh, comes in by the Pacific and the Anadir water uh, on the western side of these DBO lines. And then as you get closer, the purple is showing you near the Alaska coastal water. So this is just an example of the nutrients that come off of the transect lines. Um, the other aspect is when we pegged the DBO was on these persistent hotspots that you're seeing, this is four decades of data so we're looking at macrofauna, and these are like prey for diving sea ducks and gray whales and bearded seals and walruses that stay in one place and, are, and, and therefore record a variations of what their food supply are. And what the bright colors of red are these hotspot areas that we're seeing, particularly in the, in the southern, uh, south and north of Bering Strait. But with the opening of the ice and the fact that we have more uh, shell oil, as you know, was drill, uh, planning to drill up in this area, and BOEM had a funded program, Kamita hannah Scholl and, and uh, uh, on the, this region, as well as Chemical and Benthos. We had a lot more of the industry and government uh, analysis. So you can see the difference between the 80s, when we had very little data, to net what we were able to get in the two, 80s and 90s uh, and get into the 2000s. So those data have been uh, providing a, a, a wealth for time series. I just point out that we also have benthic videos uh, marching from the DBO1 to 5 that we were able to do this year. And those are available on YouTube. Uh, you can click on that uh, to, to watch them or go to our uh, Arctic site here at the Chesapeake Biological Lab. The other point uh, is that we have a collaboration with Monica Kedra at the Institute of, uh, of Oceanology in Poland. And she's put together a very nice taxonomic web link to uh, uh, site that can be uh, accessed. That link is also on our observing site here at the Chesapeake Lab. And just one example, the value of time series. Uh, these are stations uh, uh, funded on the, under the, uh, the DBO, particularly starting in this period in here, but they're based on prior research. And what you're seeing on the time series south of St. Lawrence Island, where we have threatened diving, de -duck, uh, diving ducks, is that you have this uh, in, uh, increased amount of uh, deposition and therefore prey base actually as in the northern part of this region. We see this in our time series data. These da DBO sites down here have actually turned to marine worms that are not a prey base for the diving ducks so that they're actually, their, their area of which they're able to feed in has contracted 
and has, uh, you're seeing that on this, uh, and the dominance of these clams for these animals. And it's only in this northern area. And this is a pattern we're actually seeing in three different regions uh, based off of uh, background data as well as DBO data. And this is related to where the currents are moving, the, uh, where the production has changed and where the current and deposition of that organic carbon that feeds the lower trophics and then feeds the upper trophics. This is just an example, the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observing Network. And I think uh, Katrina Eichen gave a nice presentation on this back in uh, uh, earlier in uh, one of our meetings. And this is just some of the examples where we have a larger program uh, that is, then has the DBO three and four embedded in it. So this is allowing us to look at some of the findings from that program within the context of these larger uh, programs. And it ranges from uh, temperature and salinity, uh, grain size you're seeing here, to benthic invertebrates, and this up here is water column. At the same time, we have a collaboration. This is just one example for having moorings in each one of the DBO sites. This is from Japan, and this paper came out by uh, Shige Nishino, and this uh, gives you the results. Again, it's showing you the spring, uh, spring blooms and the fall blooms. And so this is allowing the DBOs to be pegged on moorings. So they, the moorings are in place now in all five of the observing areas. And they have uh, both physics on them as well as biochemical uh, sensors and chlorophyll nutrients and some uh, uh, carbon measurements for PCO2. And then another cruise, just as an example, we had this uh, funded uh, by, uh, primarily by NOAA, NOAA cruise sponsored, and this was a uh, DBO's, the Northern Chukchi Integrated Study, the NCIS. And this is where we, again, occupied now in late August and September, uh, uh, three of the DBO lines and put them into a process-oriented second part of the cruise in which there were a lot of different types of uh, measurements from physics to chemistry to biology. Uh, like ocean acidification, sediment respiration were included into that. So we can compare the lines now with the uh, process crew's results. Uh, this is just one example, Bob Picard with the chief scientist from HUI. Uh, this is just from the DBO3. So we actually have cruises that started in May with the NPRB study on Asgard on this line and we have them now all the way to October that we'll be able to look at the uh, uh, transformation of the water masses. This is a uh, high oxygen from the production, very cold Pacific water on the bottom water. And then just to point out that we use a historic uh, macrofaunal benthic biomass and laid these cable. Now, uh, they've laid a new, uh, Alaska has this uh, uh, cabling company that I put to bring internet to all the coastal communities. And so we work with them to plot the stations, not only the DBO, uh, which were out, they had worked with us actually in the prior year so that we could make sure the cable was not gonna go on the line. Uh, but we also had all the uh, chief scientists interacted with the cabling company and we're moving some of their, their stations so that they obviously wouldn't pick up this cable if they're doing anything close to it. So it was a, I think it was a good example of uh, industry and science and the uh, 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 communities for, so something that's gonna be a benefit to everybody by having high-speed internet, especially for the coastal communities in Alaska. Um, this is just one example. This is by uh, Kathy Kulitz, and this is, I'm closing this out now, uh, example of seabirds. And what you're seeing here is uh, multiple cruises. These are the DBO bounding boxes surrounding the lines. A strong location of, for DBO effect. They're seeing the latitudinal gradient and seabird abundance from highest in the south to lowest as you move into the north. And she gave a very nice poster at a meeting back in uh, February, and we'll give a, a, an update on our, our observing system. And that's what the upper right figure is showing, is that change in uh, bird uh, density as you move from south to north. Um, uh, Sue Moore gave this presentation. I would just highlight where it is at. Uh, we're using the Arctic Marine pulses as coming together to look at seasonality, and we're going to uh, utilize the DBO data sets to put into this with, uh, as far as uh, looking at some subroutines of modeling, working with a variety of modelers, and we'll have discussions at our upcoming data meeting about that. And I would just like to close out, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I've listed the three performance elements, uh, the agencies involved and how it aligns with the Arctic ministerial deliverables. 
just point out that NASA has a website providing products for the DBO. Uh, NSF supporting cruises, NOAA supports cruise, US Fish and Wildlife is involved in these cruises. Um, as I already mentioned, the NCIS one, the AMBON project, and the Asgard and other NOAA uh, projects that are involved with the Arctic program and NPRB. So that's, and the second one was on the, um, the fact of having workshops and under, with PAG and also this assessment, as I mentioned. We have annual uh, DBO data meetings. We're having our fourth one in Seattle in November. We continue to uh, work with US and international science at these workshops, typo. Um, we have support for IASC uh, for the, from the Marine Working Group to bring early career scientists that are involved with the program to the data meeting. And we also have, I mentioned, we have this paper coming out in Arctic. We also have a deep sea research DBO volume that's in the, uh, uh, prep is, uh, we have papers coming in and should be uh, finalized by uh, next June. Uh, we also have a special session at the Ocean Sciences meeting. We also have our Marine Ecosystem Working, uh, this uh, Marine Ecosystem Collaborative Team Town Hall. I don't have the date, but we'll post that on the uh, IARPIC website in which we'll be highlighting a multitude of the uh, marine ecosystem uh, topics at that town hall for the uh, interactions with science community. And then we are working with IAS uh, working group to, uh, on the regional assessment and how DBO fits within that. And then the third one I would close out with is that we have, we're working with local communities, trying to develop a collection with the coastal communities observing that they have. Um, and to get this phenology, this is the, what Sue calls the conventional Western science. And on the right is what was published for the, uh, 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 for the uh, local community, their, their calendar of life between January to December and trying to interface the, uh, the two types of observing systems and cross talk that with the, uh, some of the work that's being done on the DBO. And finally, I close out, I just say that it is expanding. There was a working group uh, on the Atlantic DBO. I'm giving a uh, Marit Rice start at the University of Tromso. There are six, five countries that are working on, and this was the first season to put together an Atlantic DBO. They're including that in their sampling uh, this season. Uh, there's also working Germany and Russia about putting a, a potential line in the Laptev Sea, and we're having discussions about the uh, Baffin Bay Area in Canada. So uh, that gives you, uh, that's in a nutshell, I think there's more information you can glean by going back and looking at this presentations, but I want to thank all the people involved in PAG and DBO, financial support, and I've just outlined some of the uh, key websites, including uh, where we send the parameter data file that was initiated under the UCAR program and now out uh, of the Arctic data center that we're uh, linking, uh, one of the areas we're linking our uh, NSF funding and others to uh, Arctic data. So at that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Hello. Questions, questions for Jackie? I'm gonna unshare this. Oh, Jackie, Greg, I just wondered if you had any potential funding from Canada, especially for DBO8. Well, Canada supports, uh, you know, when we go out on our annual cruises, uh, both in the Laurier, they support their own scientists. So half of that cruises, all the physics coming off the Sir Wilfrid Laurier comes out of Canadian funding by DFO. Uh, also for, they fund for the uh, phytoplankton work, primary production work, some of the tracer work, radioisotopes. So it's a split on that. Uh, Humphrey Melling from DFO is occupying the DBO8, uh, DBO four line, I think, as we speak, and then DFO, as well as the uh, other thing in Canada, supporting a program to include moorings, uh, zooplankton sampling fish on the DBO six line. So Canada, and they actually expressed interest of putting in those DBO lines in the Baffin Bay. So there are Canadian, uh, you know, tight Canadian collaboration there and uh, it looks like continuing because I've been approached by the, uh, the folks coming to the DBO workshop that are from Canada on those newer ones, uh, occupying the DBO 8 and the DBO, uh, the, even our DBO 4. Sounds good. Other questions for uh, Jackie?
Uh, if not, um, thank you, Jackie, for uh, such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, 